Hey, Ronnie. Hey, Lou. Hey, uh, on today's show, we've got two stories about drinking. Ooh. And I'd go as far as to say problem drinking. <laughs> Wait till you hear I the drink, story. I get drunk, I fall down. No, no problem. problem. Wait till you hear this story about the wedding photographer, and then maybe we have something we can, a category we can classify her in. She should be watching this episode. All right, that's all next on The Next Men Are So Smart. Ronnie, a Texas based wedding photographer, who, by the way, is Kind of hot. She's not unattractive. <laughs> she was arrested last week, and uh, all while she was on the job. So, what happened, Ron? Wedding attendees alerted an off-duty sheriff's deputy who was working security after reportedly finding Katie Medina. Oh, I'm sorry, Meta, Meta, 26, having sex with a male wedding guest. Huh. Hmm. Convenient. Yeah, that's not a necessarily a bad thing. That's like dipping your pen in the company ink. <laughs> the photographer and part-time model was Ooh. told to stop her unsavory behavior, but instead ran outside and began hollering, according to the New York Daily News. An arrest report stated that Meta was booted from the ceremony just before she urinated on a nearby tree. <laughs> Okay, she's got a lot going for her here. <laughs> per this uh, television station, responding officers noted that she reeked of alcohol, was in possession of Xanax, which they believe she was mixing. Uh, duh. The photographer allegedly hurled multiple threats at officers as they hauled her into the patrol car. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Y'all's daughters are dead. Y'all's families will all be dead by Christmas, she screamed. That's great. Oh, nice boy. job. Yeah, that's the icing on the cake right there. My dad is going to find out about this, and then y'all, not censored, are dead. D-E-A-D, -E dead. She's charged with public intoxication and felony of obstruction or retaliation. Uh, she said she went outside. And she said these two men tried to approach her and do inappropriate things. Uh, and she said she was yelling and trying to get help and things got turned around in a negative way. I, you know, I can see they're just making stuff up about her. Hmm. It's not like this is out of the norm. Well, certainly she got turned around. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and she also got turned. <laughs> And part of this, I know, uh, I read, actually, I saw a news report, and her sister was saying that she wasn't working this wedding. So, and that somebody slipped something into her drink. So, how convenient, though, that she would happen to have the Xanax on her when she was arrested. Good point, officer. Yeah. That's kind of incriminating evidence, huh? Yeah. Thanks. Now... Uh, and if it's prescribed to her? You, you can do it. You can certainly do it. But you can't. Xanax and alcohol should never mix. And you, your doctor would, would never, ever uh, tell you that you can. Well, okay, so, but I'm, st I'm still trying to understand. Um, Xanax is an antidepressant. No, I know. Yeah. I, yeah, no, but uh, what I'm saying is... She didn't look depressed to me, though. <laughs> <laughs> She's got nothing to be depressed about. She's actually impressed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I'm just saying, having alcohol and Xanax is not against the law. No. Um, so what she must have been arrested for was the peeing on the tree. Uh, yeah, well... And then the threats to the officer's family. Correct. Mm -hmm. And if... Uh, where was this? Was this in Texas, I think? Uh, yeah. So, if Texas is anything like California, I'm sure they have a statute on the books regarding uh, public intoxication. Aha. Uh -huh. So, she was probably arrested for that, which is not really a, it's not the crime of the century by any right. stretch of the imagination. We take a lot of people to jail for that. Now, had she been driving, that would have been. That'd be a, way yeah, different yeah. and a mm -hmm. hundred times worse. Right. Yeah. Right. Just, uh, just hooking up with some random wedding participant. Well, Ronnie, would you say that this girl would be a classified as a problem drinker? Possibly. I, my biggest question, though, is 
does she shoot bachelor parties? And I'm just, I'm asking for a friend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not not me. No, 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 not me. No. No. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up. But she could be a problem drinker. <laughs> a new study says there are five different types of problem drinkers. Here's what they are. For those who choose to drink alcohol, the healthiest level of consumption is typically defined as up to a drink per day for women or two for men. Low risk drinking, meanwhile, is defined for women as no more than three drinks in a single day and no more than seven per week. For men, it's four in a day and 14 per week. People who exceed these benchmarks are considered at risk for alcohol use disorder as well as health conditions such as cancer and cognitive decline. You know, when we were growing up, this right here was known as the 60s. <laughs> exactly, yeah. All right. This was nothing. Uh, as clear as these definitions are on paper, however, identifying problem drinking can be more challenging in real life. Tolerance levels, behavior, and personal definitions of acceptability can be highly variable, sometimes making it difficult to figure out who has troublesome drinking habits. Uh, by a new study published this week in Alcohol and Alcoholism, I subscribe to that, by the way, uh, identified five distinct subgroups of problem drinkers, potentially making it easier to zero in on elf unhealthy behavior and tailor some treatments. Okay, so we don't know your life. Right. We don't know what goes on beyond your front door. You invite us into your house or on your computer or to your phone, but we don't know. So listen up and see if any of these categories seem to fit you. All right, we do this, yeah, to get a few laughs, but kind of as a public service. Public service. Okay. Alcohol use disorder is not really a one-size-fits-all diagnosis. Uh, the approach uh, allows us to be more fine-tuned in detection and early screening and early prevention. Let's see. The best possible treatment for any illness in psychiatry is when it's customized to a patient's needs. The more we have some classifications, it can help cl clinicians get gear and treat the little bit and make it more personalized. Uh, this paper was based on data from about 5,400 current drinkers between the ages of 18 and 64. Each of the individuals reported at least two of the 11, 11 symptoms of past year alcohol use disorder. Okay. Enough to qualify for a clinical diagnosis. Based on those stats we gave you earlier. Exactly. Uh, the symptoms included at times drinking more or longer than intended struggling to cut back, experiencing physical side effects or withdrawal symptoms from alcohol, finding that drinking interfered with personal or professional life, and continuing to drink despite health or personal problems. Okay, so the five classes of drinkers, the most common classification, adverse effects only, applied to the 34% of people in the study who said they had experienced hangovers, or withdrawal symptoms related to excessive drinking, but few other problems. This classification was most prevalent among young adults. I think so. Uh, next in prevalence, 25% uh, were those at risk of alcohol-induced injury mm. uh, through behaviors such as driving, swimming, engaging in unsafe, unsafe sex. Is that like on a diving board? <laughs> Or, or while doing wedding photography. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> while under the influence, surprisingly, uh, this trait was most common among older adults, peaking around age 58. Oh, the young ones. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought that it was so interesting that I double and triple checked my data, says the uh, researcher. She speculates that young adults may be more likely to use ride-sharing services true, after true. drinking. 100% uh -huh. true. Uh, rather than driving themselves, or may be less likely to view activities they engage in while drunk as dangerous. After that came the highly <coughs> problematic, low perceived life interference group, making up about 21% of the sample. These individuals reported many symptoms of problem drinking, except those that dealt with adverse effects on home life, job, or academic performance. Young adults made up a disproportionately high percentage of this class as well. 
Perhaps because for many young people, especially college students, drinking is a major, major part of their social lives rather than an impediment. They have a lot of freedom. They can do whatever they want. Mom and dad aren't around. And the researcher says her guess is that they think it doesn't interfere with their life. But frankly, it does. Yeah. Uh, I remember as in college, The Graduate. Oh, sure. The bar called The Graduate. In Davis, California. Uh, actually, there was one over by Sac State. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I completely forgot about that. over near Sac State. Yeah. And they, uh, on Tuesday nights, they had dollar pitchers of beer. Oh. You didn't need a glass for a dollar. You got a pitcher. You drank the whole thing from the pitcher. Yes. That was on Tuesdays. So, yeah. needless to say, Wednesday mornings yep. to get to class uh, could be a challenge. For so, sure. So, again... It is something that could have an adverse effect on your job, yep. your studies, mm -hmm. uh, classes. Mm -hmm. uh, this next group was 13% of respondents fell into the difficulty cutting back class or those who had a low prevalence of most symptoms but who struggled to reduce their alcohol consumption. Hmm. Uh, adults older than 53 were most likely to fall into this group. If someone says in their 60s, it's possible that they've been experiencing symptoms of a use disorder for a long time. They're at this precipice of how do I cut back and realizing that they're struggling to do so. Hmm. A lot of people think of someone with an alcohol use disorder as someone who is the highly problematic class and is meeting every single one of these symptoms. But that's simply not the case. Alcohol use disorder doesn't just look like class five. It looks like all of these. I think uh, that's that's really true. Yeah. Um, you may be showing signs of this, but there are underlying signs of those other things where you're dipping your foot in the pool, I would guess. Yeah. You know, it's really, um, I don't know how easy it is to break it down into five categories. Uh, I mean, even those, these are kind of vague still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what you have to do because you can't, it's not black and white. Right. There's there's gray area in between each group. Well, you know, Ronnie and I fall into the category of over, what was it, 53, I think? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, um, you know, this show, we appreciate you watching and we believe that part of the reason that you watch is because it's honest. And so I, you know, I'm going to be completely honest with you uh, now. Um, I can tell you that I probably have two or three beers a night. Okay. Um, why? Well, I'm six foot three and I weigh about 250 pounds. And frankly, three beers is not going to really get me all that buzzed. Right. And for me, it's it's more about the coming home from work being done with all the responsibilities that are associated with that, and just enjoying the taste of an ice cold beer. And I will tell you this too, that first one, a lot of times, I just grab two at a time. Because that first one, it goes down really fast. <laughs> now, uh, with my next breath, let me also say that it in no way interferes with my uh, work or my life, or I, certainly I'm not a student. Right. Um, but and you're not jumping in your car and driving down to buy more beer. No, this after, is in yeah. my, in my garage. That's right. where I have my beer out with my television and stuff. Right. And um, so you know, some people might say, "Well, it sounds like he's got an alcohol problem." Mm. But see, it's the gray area that we're talking about. Right. You know, does it affect what you do? During, oh, and that's another thing, too. I never, never have a beer before 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, people with alcohol problems, if you want to see somebody that might have a problem, go out and see who's having drinks with lunch. Yeah. Okay? And then point the finger at those people. Yeah. Uh, frankly, if I were to have, on a Sunday, uh, football on, you know, maybe it's a rainy day, nothing could get done outside. Um, if I were to have a beer at noon, I'd be asleep by one o'clock <laughs> so, and I'd sleep the whole afternoon and I waste my whole day off. So I don't go for that. Now, again, if you're pointing a finger, 
those are signs that I think that you might want to look more towards. You might have a problem. Yeah. If, yeah. if you have to have a drink in the morning to go to work, right. you've got a problem. Now, I will say this. And we're not the first ones that are telling. You no. know this. Yeah. You know. So, I'm in a category. I'm not sure where you categorize it. I probably have three or four beers. A year. Every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I did go to lunch with some friends I hadn't seen in quite a while. This is maybe like a month or two ago. And we met for lunch at the Yard House, which is a big... Uh, Oh my God! They have like a hundred different types of beers. Beer on oh, tap. Oh yeah, on tap. Yeah. Yeah, and I had a beer at lunch, but it was more of a celebration than it was anything else. And we all had one beer, and we all drove home. Yeah. So it was it was just nothing more than that. Well, I, honestly, Ronnie, um, we we were someplace recently where you and I had a beer. Do you remember what that was? Oh, uh, Stingrays. Oh, that's right. When we shot our show out there. Yeah. Yeah, you were up for a beer, and then it was yeah. good. You had an 805. I had an 805. I, I had an 805 at Yard House, too. Uh-huh. Well, <laughs> so. you know what? If it works the first time, <laughs> it'll work the second time. All right, so look, we don't mean to sit here and preach. What you do with your life is entirely up to you. Right. And, and frankly, none of our business. However, if you wish to comment, if you have something you'd like to say or weigh in on this, you can do so below in the comment section. Um, Ronnie would be the first person to tell you. We are very quick to reply to your comments. Um, we know how valuable your time is. Yep. And if you've taken the time to send us a message, then we will take the time to get back to you. So if you feel so compelled to do so, right there below, we'll do it for you. Uh, also below, you'll find a list of all of our sponsors, our social media, and also um, our email address, which is coming across your screen right now. There it goes. Okay, so um, until, oh, by the way, if you enjoyed the show, I know you did, give it a thumbs up, and also subscribe to our channel, please, and click the bell. See that bell? You click that, you get notifications. Careful, it's not moving. Where is it? <laughs> it's not moving, it's right there. Uh, uh, you'll get notifications each time a new show comes out and uh, you won't miss a single beat. Okay, I'm Lou Gallagher. I'm Corvette Ronnie. What do you say we do this on the next episode of Men Are So Smart? Yeah? Uh, check. Yeah? Huh? Yeah? Huh? Yeah? Huh? Yeah? Totally. Huh? yeah. Right. Remember those guys? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Huh? yeah. Next time.